So, so we thought, um, whilst we had Sarah here, Sarah's a very busy person, as you, as you know, because of her, of her various hats. So we thought, why well, should it be a good opportunity to ask some questions about the network and the other work that she's, she's doing? So for those of you who don't know, obviously Sarah is the PI and the leader of this Network Plus, but she's also, as of about a year ago, yeah, she's now the Chief Scientific Advisor for the Department for Transport, which must take up uh, more, probably more than 100% of her time, but she also retains a chair at the University of Nottingham, where she was previously the PVC for EDI and people. So, so we're, we're very lucky to have Sarah here. So, so Sarah, just to start, I'm always interested when I'm talking to, to successful people, then how did they get to where they, they are? So I think you got into an interest in digital manufacturing because of your work on, uh, when you were a professor, when you were working on um, methods and yeah, uh, I mean, people it, and it, technology. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I'd describe myself as a successful person, but uh, it's, um, uh, it's all, as many academic careers are, I didn't, I didn't wake up one morning and have a secret plan. Um, I think that the thing that I always wanted to do from when I did my, I did a master's degree in human factors. So I'm a professor of human factors. Human factors is about understanding human capabilities and limitations and taking that into account when we design and implement novel technologies. And in a way, I'm very lucky that that's the bit of science that I fell in love with because it can be applied in so many different domains. Mm -hmm. So I've worked over my career in manufacturing, in healthcare, and in transport. Um, I've been able to be a bit flighty, so I've been able to sort of do things that interest me. Um, and it's really, really interesting when you get to sit in a railway signal box or shadow a doctor or go and visit manufacturing sites to just see the diversity of the mm -hmm. different roles that there are out there. But there's a common thread for me, which is about how we understand human cognitive capabilities, so how we process information, how we make decisions, and how we take advantage of the brilliance of people, as well as managing the potential fallibilities of people. So um, that's sort of been the thread. Um, actually, I think the reason I got into manufacturing was because at the University of Nottingham, Human factors happens to be in a manufacturing engineering department. Mm. Um, and so my postgraduate master's course was human factors in manufacturing systems. So we were taken to manufacturing environments. We learned about some of the basics of um, uh, manufacturing, lean manufacturing, Kanban systems, and um, uh, factory design and layout, and the sort of things that you need to understand if you're then going to advise from a human factors point of view. And then, um, to be honest, so I, I got my PhD in 1999, um, and, and we've really seen the funding in manufacturing sort of wax and wane mm -hmm. over the years. Um, and as I say, because I've got flexibility in the domains I've worked in, I've actually slightly been able to follow the money, because there isn't always funding in healthcare, there isn't always funding in transport. So I've been able to respond to the funding opportunities that are out there as well. And, I mean, so I've been an academic for um, uh, slightly more than 20 years now. Um, and uh, I always sort of talk about for the first 10 years, it was a little bit like I was sort of patted on the head and left in the corner and sort of told, oh, go away, dear. We've got some terribly important technologies to develop. Come back when we've developed those technologies. Then we'll think about the people. Now, actually, it would have been more effective for everyone to think about the people when I was 26. But um, actually what happened was in my mid-30s, uh, the funding landscape completely changed and there was a big push on multidisciplinary funding, mm -hmm. particularly from EPSRC. This also coincided, coincided with me having two small children, which meant that I was reluctant to do so much travel for the European projects I'd been involved with. So I actually made a decision entirely on the basis of family, um, which was I wanted to focus on national funding um, because probably wrongly I thought that would involve me being away from home less um, and having to do less, less travel. Um, and I just decided, oh, I'm going to go for see if I can get some EPSRC funding, see if I can just focus on working in national rather than international context. And that coincided with 
to be honest, many people in engineering recognising the importance of um, considering the human as part of the overall system. Um, and one of the areas where we've seen that really come through is in digital manufacturing. Um, a few years afterwards, I can't remember when now, um, I was asked to be on the advisory group for um, uh, the Manufacturing the Future team at EPSRC. And I think there are several others in the room who have either been on that group or are on that group now. Um, I'll be honest, when they phoned me up, they, they didn't have a very good process at that time. They, they didn't have sort of transparent process. I got a, a, a mysterious phone call asking me if I wanted to be on the advisory group. Um, I did say, are you sure you've got the right person? Because I was really surprised but pleased that they wanted someone with my background to advise on manufacturing the future as a program. Um, and, uh, and actually, I've just finished a period on EPSRC Council which reflects me having spent, I think, over 10 years in the advisory frameworks of EPSRC. And I'm actually really pleased to see now how consideration of people is embedded into so many of those national funding programmes. So it was a very long answer. No, it was very good. It was a very good answer. There's a couple of things where I pick up. So one was you mentioned about multidisciplinary research. So I think that's quite a tough thing for many academics to do. It's much easier just to stick to your little narrow field and go down and down and down and then retire at, at, at when you get to 65 or, or, or whatever. Yeah. But doing multidisciplinary research requires you to, to show your ignorance. You have to be prepared to go into meetings and say, actually, I don't really understand what this other group does and put enormous effort in to understand that before you can then move, move forward. A lot of people won't, won't do that. I find it easy to do now to show my ignorance because I'm at that stage where I care less. But I think I would have, <laughs> I think I would have struggled... Uh, as a, as a young researcher to show my ignorance in front of professors in other fields? I think, well, oh, right, that's, I was going to give an inappropriate answer. Um, no, feel, feel, I, feel free. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to give the inappropriate answer and then I'll think of the appropriate answer. I was 26, I was a woman, I don't think they expected me to know anything anyway. Um, and, and actually, I did mm. genuinely walk into the room and had the element of surprise on my side because I didn't look like the stereotypical view as to what an engineer might look like. Um, that was wrong. We want to change that. We are changing that. But honestly, that worked to my advantage because people didn't expect me to know the periodic table off by heart or um, know all of the mathematical equations associated with fluid dynamics. And so when I was able to speak vaguely eloquently about something that sounded slightly scientific, um, people sort of sat up and thought, oh, golly, she does know a little bit about something. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting, and I have talked to some of my male colleagues about this, actually, who um, her, have expressed that they sometimes suffer from the opposite, that because they're professor of X manufacturing, they walk into the room and uh, they um, are expected to know everything in the world about everything to do with manufacturing or everything to do with engineering, mm. um, and slightly struggle with that sort of admittance of, um, uh, of a lack of knowledge, because none of us know everything about everything, even though we'd like to think maybe, maybe that we do. So I think I was a bit naive, but I think that naivety worked to my advantage, because I just sort of blundered through. Um, I think also I really enjoyed multidisciplinary research. Um, it definitely was a disadvantage at some points in my career, particularly when I was going for that first promotion from what was then lecturer to senior lecturer, and I think now would be assistant professor to associate professor, my CV did not look as neat and tidy. I was not, and still am not, a world leader in a specific technology or a specific theory. Um, mm. I am a generalist, and there was a point where suddenly that turned from a disadvantage into an advantage. Mm. But I have also learned to embrace my ignorance and ask the questions. And actually, I was with someone who, and I, I will share her name because I'm saying something nice. So one of, my, one of the brilliant things about being a chief scientific advisor is you get to work with the other chief scientific advisors around government, and they're all amazing. And I was with um, one of my colleagues from the Ministry of Defense, um, Professor Dame Angela McLean. And she's brilliant. And I was on a visit with her to um, something, and I was really, really struck by how well she asked questions. 
Um, and she has just honed the ability to ask insightful questions. Mm -hmm. And you realize that actually, if you want to learn, the wrong thing to do is to spout loads of nonsense. The right thing to do is to ask really interesting questions. Mm. Um, because actually, the people who know the really deep knowledge that we all need to learn from are people like our colleague we saw earlier doing that brilliant presentation about hydrogen um, technology and trials. That deep knowledge that you get from actually being hands-on and trying something is worth its weight in gold. But also, the people who are actually doing their PhDs right now or doing their postdoc research, they're the ones with the deep and detailed knowledge. The point at which I knew everything off by heart about everything I was doing was when I was doing my PhD. Mm. Um, I can still remember the results from some of my PhD studies because you never again have that sort of in-depth immersion, I think, mm. in the science. So, so I think that, um, actually, I'm, I'm really lucky because the thing I've enjoyed is multidisciplinary research, and I managed to get over that point in my career where that was a bit of a disadvantage mm. and make it into an advantage. I am slightly jealous sometimes of those people who've got really neat and tidy PhDs, uh, uh, neat and tidy CVs, sorry, and, mm. can, and can show their gradual and incremental and really, really impressive learning in a particular deep technology area. And we need both mm. types of people within the ecosystem, I mm. think. It's interesting you said about asking questions because mm. I think that's really important particularly mm. in a role like yours but I also think it's really important for researchers as uh, as well if people put as much effort into thinking about what the questions are they're trying to address yeah. uh, as in, a, in addressing them I, I think that's a much better way to spend your time there's the group at um, Bell Labs who came up with uh, all these inventions got lots of Nobel prizes for a period of time in the 40s 50s and 60s and invented the transistor for, uh, for example and all the information theory which now drives a lot of what goes on in the world and uh, and the guys in charge of the lab said that how much effort they put into formulating questions and the art was that it has to be a question that was important to answer but it had to be tractable mm -hmm. so in the sense that you had to be able to make a dint to to make some progress against that question in a reasonable time scale and for them it was five to five to ten years but i do think that's good advice for for, for all of us. I haven't always done that myself, but it is, it is good advice. Um, I mean, you mentioned the um, asking questions and, and the, the, the way you got used to doing multidisciplinary research. My experience, so I was on the, uh, the scientific advisory panel with Sarah of the Department for Transport uh, and until Sarah, Sarah uh, became the chief scientific advisor and I dropped off the end of, the, end of my time on the, on the committee, but I found it just within transport, it's like a, it's like a whole set of subjects within them, within themselves. The first meeting that I was at, so I was slightly nervous, never having been on one of these government committees before. And you, you get the agenda a couple of days before, right? The first thing we're going to discuss was hyperloop. Yes, I knew nothing about hyperloop. And then we'll move on to electric aeroplanes. Yes, and, and so you're sitting on this committee, and then they, they say, okay, Paul, what's your what's your view view on this? Which uh, yeah, you get used to it after a while, don't you? But, but finding ways to use your background of research in a particular subject in order to, to ask the right questions or to, to give advice, I, I find it took me a year or two before I got the hang of that. It's I, so the way in which the Chief Scientific Advisor role is organised is that we're deliberately there on a fixed period. Mm. So I'm initially on a four-year fixed period, and I think, it, uh, I think Phil, my predecessor, did up to six years. Um, and it's deliberate because your job is to provide independent challenge to the department. And so um, uh, that it's to try and sort of bring diversity of view into the department, but also make sure that you don't sort of go native mm -hmm. as a member of the department. Um, I think by the end of my tenure, I will still be discovering new things that I need to understand within the department. Mm -hmm. I think just this week, I've had conversations about autonomous vehicles ammonia for um, uh, propulsion in maritime and in rail, um, uh, future data distribution systems for transport. Um, uh, we sometimes have conversations about oh, uh, active travel and um, micro mobility mm. and how we design future solutions for that. A lot of my job is actually not so much I, I actually spend remarkably little of my time giving scientific advice. 
um, I spend the vast majority of my time making connections across the mm -hmm. department. So the mm -hmm. conversation yesterday about ammonia was a really interesting one because I was talking to someone from the rail industry and they were really interested in being put in touch with people from maritime to understand if there was any shared learning they could have about the use, distribution, um, the engineering requirements for use of ammonia in transport. So I don't think that, I, I'm definitely not the person in the department who knows the most about science and engineering, um, but I'm the person whose responsibility is it is to put all of the different people who know all of the different mm. deep things about technology in touch with each other. Mm. One of the things I'm really pleased we've done since I've joined is we've established a new team called the Emerging Technologies Team. And the job of this team is to make sure that there is deep expertise within the Department for Transport in technology, because actually as a government body, it can very quickly um, become very dominated by the very real demands on delivery that the mm. department has, but we need deep expertise in science and engineering in the department as well. Um, so there are three technologies we're focusing on, position navigation and timing, artificial intelligence and autonomy, um, and uh, communications, so 5G and 6G communications. With a view to understanding the needs and requirements of different teams across the department, embedding that deep expertise within those parts mm -hmm. of the department and actually then making themselves redundant and moving on to the next emerging technology. Mm -hmm. So, because it's not realistic to have deep technical expertise in all of the different parts of the department, but we also don't want to be um, completely reliant on expertise from outside the department mm -hmm. because you do need the understanding of how a government department works to provide advice in the right form and with the mm -hmm. right impact. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that interface to the outside world is mm. important. And I, and I think there's some work to be done to educate people in academia about how best to get their ideas into government yeah. to really make a difference to yeah. the economy and society. I, I, I learned more about that from sitting on the committee. I'd never ever been, been taught it, or I don't think you can buy a book on it. Is that something that maybe we should be doing more of? Definitely. And, and actually, I think I'm going to put a shout out for the Connected Everything um, network here because I think that one of the things that I hope has come out of some of the work that we've done here is help researchers communicate their activity and their research in a form that is accessible to mm. the outside world. Mm. So one of the things I've always been a really strong advocate of is the one-page summaries of the feasibility studies. Um, and we've obviously always been, I've, I've never felt embarrassed about being slightly demanding of those of you who deliver feasibility studies, because I'd like to think that the model is that we provide support, but we also place expectations on how um, the work is communicated. But the reason for that is that I know that government ministers and policy makers or decision makers in industry will not read a 200-page report but they will read a one-page summary. And mm. then, if it's of relevance to them, they will follow up. And we have seen that happen with Connected Everything feasibility studies. Um, another network that I think does this very well is uh, a network that's a friend of ours at Connected Everything, which is the Petrus network. Um, it does an awful lot of work looking at um, Internet of Things, and I'm sure some of you have come across this. I was involved in one of their policy briefings recently that I thought was really impressive because they'd produced a, a two-page document um, summarising um, uh, uh, something around the use of artificial intelligence in government. Um, they did, I think it was a half an hour briefing and mm. had a half an hour Q&A. And we got an awful lot out of that very short discussion. Um, and this isn't about dumbing down. The people I work with in the department are very, very bright, very able to grasp um, ideas very quickly. Ministers ask very insightful and detailed questions as well and want to get to the science very quickly. Um, but they are time poor, mm. so um, uh, don't necessarily want to navigate through um, very long and wordy documents. Um, it's really hard to express the complexity of the ideas that we explore in academic research in a way that's accessible to the outside world. Mm. Um, mm. and, and someone, actually one of my predecessors, was very kind when I got the job. I spoke to almost all of the people who'd had the job before. And one of them, who I think was the first um, uh, DFT chief scientific advisor, someone called Frank Kelly at the University of Cambridge, said to me, being a chief scientific advisor 
is like giving lots of first year university lectures. And I thought that was a really, really good analogy because I have had a couple of scenarios where I've suddenly been asked about something, I don't know if you remember, there was um, a, um, a, a concern that was raised about the 5G telecoms rollouts and aircraft um, and the potential interference between um, the 5G rollout and some of the technology um, on the aircraft, I think it was the altimeter in particular. And we suddenly got an email saying, is this a problem? I first found out about it when I was, I sometimes read the BBC News over breakfast and go, uh-oh, um, this is going to be a, this is going to be an interesting day, and this was one of them. Although actually, it didn't come to my it didn't come to my inbox till the afternoon, and uh, um, and basically this problem had come to light in the states, and I was being asked, is this also a problem for us in the U.S. in the U.K.? Um, fortunately, one of the people in the emerging technologies team had very deep expertise, so we were able to very quickly a look at the science and discover it wasn't a problem for the UK. There was a, a technical difference between the nature of the 5G rollout in the UK and the US that meant that um, the slight difference in frequency um, uh, meant that we were further enough away from the frequency to not have an issue with interference, but there was a, a, a more of a risk in the US. And there was a particular plane that was also um, a, a particular problem because of the way the technology worked. We were able to get to the bottom of that very quickly, but also my colleague did a brilliant set of slides that explained the principles and the issue in words of one syllable. We were able to send that round our senior staff colleagues um, and they were able to then reassure others. Um, and that was just like preparing a first year university mm. lecture. Mm. Um, because that's, again, sorry, for those of you who aren't lecturers, sometimes when you're giving a first year university lecture, it's not your area of expertise and you just have to learn mm. it and you have to rehearse it and you learn an awful lot by teaching, actually. Mm. Um, and I just thought that was a great analogy that has really come through. I think, I think that's a really good model because a lot of academics, uh, and I know I've done it myself, when you're asked to give advice, you, 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 you Sometimes I think it's like writing a paper. We're trying to give your own novel work, which is only going to be a tiny fraction yeah. of everything out there, whereas what you have to do is to synthesise yeah. the state of the art, whoever did it, not, not just yep. you. Definitely. Yeah, and, that, and that's a struggle for uh, sometimes for academics who just want to talk about their own work. <laughs> yeah, not that I've ever. Um, okay, so, so we're, um, uh, let's just think about connected everything. Um, for the last five minutes that we that we have, so um, so I think your input into thinking, getting people to think about policy, has really come through uh, today. For example, the last session, the fantastic 2050 thought piece that's been going on is a classic example of, of that. And then there's been the fantastic pilot studies that we heard something uh, about some of them earlier on earlier on today, but. When, when you step back from Connected Everything, what, what do you think has been the real successes of Connected Everything? So, I'm really proud of what we've achieved in Connected Everything, actually. Um, do you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the enablement of the types of conversations we've had today. Um, there is nothing nicer than coming into a room and actually hearing the breadth and depth and quality of the questions that have been asked in the presentations or the um, uh, lack of need to prod people to start having conversations when we just had that um, uh, workshop just now. I know that when I was an early career academic, the opportunity to discuss my own research and other people's research was so important. And I mean, I have to um, commend Deborah and Ollie and uh, the others who've also kept this going during the pandemic. Mm. Um, we were, as many people were, our plans were completely thrown out the window, um, really, when the pandemic hit, as a network that was predicated on many face-to-face -face interactions and, um, and networking, um, thinking about how that looks like in um, uh, a world where we're not necessarily able to meet face to face was a real challenge. And I think that the work of, of the team, and I take no credit for this at all, has, has actually made things better um, as a result of the way we've had to embrace the use of online technology. Mm. Um, Ollie was talking about um, the use of the Miro boards to capture 
um, the work during um, the workshops, for example. Deborah's done so much work thinking about accessibility of our meetings um, and our activities through the pandemic. We've uh, done the recruitment and the selection of the feasibility studies online, which is much better for people with care responsibilities or travel restrictions that um, we, we wouldn't have done in previous times because we were caught in that trap of assuming that the best way to make a judgment was through having people in the same room as us, and we were wrong. Mm. Um, and so I think that actually we've been able to embrace the um, opportunities, sadly, that the pandemic has given us, and I hope brought more people um, into the fold. The, the reason that, and it, it came about in a very sort of um, uh, slightly odd way, actually, the network really, and, and Paul, you were involved in the very start, where the identified need for a network um, uh, came from uh, the funders and I was sort of in either the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time and ended up pulling the initial proposal together and the fundamental philosophy in that initial proposal was bringing people into the world of manufacturing who were not already there mm. and bringing new mm. voices and new opinions and new ideas mm. into um, digital manufacturing and I think we've achieved that um, it's absolutely brilliant to see many people's careers thrive and for them to be able to say and articulate the very small part that Connected Everything played in that as well. Um, it was actually something Pete said early on that I think it, it's not just the funding, it's also the community and the engagement and the support. And cause it can be a bit lonely being an early career mm -hmm. academic. And, mm -hmm. And you can, you can very often, I mean, uh, the academic life is, is full of failure. You know, we get papers rejected all the time. I still get mm. papers rejected. I still get proposals rejected. And you, you sort of toughen up, but it's hard and it still hurts. Mm. Um, and so um, just having that community of support and like-minded individuals, I think, has mm. been really, really valuable. So, um, so I'm really proud of what Connected Everything has achieved, but I take none of the credit because... Um, there have been so many people who have been involved in, in delivery of it. Mm. I, think, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think we often think that the idea is to get, to get uh, the output of research out from universities into other parts of the economy, other sectors of industry, through papers and talks and so on, conference, but it's actually the people who mm. carry those ideas through. The ideas are never properly formed in a way that industry can just pick them up. You need to build these connections. And I think that I think that Connect Everything's been really good at doing that. And I think that'll be a good legacy for it, as well as things like the fantastic reports and the pilot projects will be those long standing connections between early career researchers and the companies that they're working with, which I hope will will, will go on and on. Um, well, the, the bell went to end the, <laughs> the quarter, of a, quarter of an hour. That's quite, uh, that's quite impressive. I, uh, I live in Durham and I use the cathedral bells to, uh, to know when I have to go on Zoom because the, hour, the, the top of the hour has come up. But that, that, having one in your own building is quite, is quite nice. So, um, okay, so I think I wanted to pick up something that you said just to, just to end, but I want, really want to thank Deborah and Ollie who've done such a fantastic job in very difficult circumstances of keeping a network together at a time when we couldn't actually meet face to face, which wasn't what we expected when it all started. So I think they've done a fantastic job and uh, I'm full of praise for them. But, but also you, Sarah, for, for setting the direction. And it's been interesting as you've been talking about the things that are important to you and the things you've done through your career, how you've embedded those in this, in this network so that, that more people, particularly early career researchers who are the important people here can benefit from it so that's absolutely fantastic i'll just end with one thing so um so as well as the jeremy paxson alan partridge thing i, I could also do the lauren laverne uh, ending so uh, so which one boot would you take to your desert island uh, you didn't so, warn me about this um i know you're keen on books and reading so oh dearie me what one book would i take Thank you, Deborah. Oh, um, gosh. <laughs> well, um, so, so I, I, uh, I'm a cricket fan, and uh, I think that if I had a 
pad of paper and a pencil or even a computer and the wisdom boot of cricket records, I could find all sorts of exciting new forms of statistic. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, an Ashes winning year. Well, so, something involving Don Bradman, maybe, who's a big hero of mine. But, yeah, so, okay, yeah, thank, thanks, it Deborah, up. for giving yeah, me Yeah, you filled it up. Right, so, so I've got, I've actually, we bought our dream house a few years ago, and we have actually got a room that we, we keep trying to call the library, but we're not posh enough, so we, we revert to calling it the dining room, which it isn't, it's what it used to be. Um, and it's got, it's got walls of books, and I actually married a librarian, which oh. in my grandma's eyes was the best possible <laughs> life choice I could ever have made. So um, my poor husband, when we used to go and meet my grandma, um, he used to expect, she used to expect him to have read all of the books in the library. Um, and uh, she said, oh, Craig, you'll, you'll know this book, won't you? Um, but, uh, um, but actually, I'm going to say, so, so a book that I would recommend everyone ever reads, if you haven't read it before, it's a classic. It's one that we had to read at school, which is To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm. Because actually, I'm a bit of a sucker for a good story, and it's a really well-written story. But actually... It's one of those books that you should reread every decade because I think you take a different perspective as you have a, a different situation in your life. So I read it at school and I didn't really understand the implicit racism that was being discussed. I, didn't, I don't want to give away too much about it if you haven't read it. You know, there's things about drug addiction in there, there's bullying, there's family relationships, there's mm. bereavement, there's, there's all sorts of things that are stories about people that come through in the different characters. Mm. Um, and, um, and I think that it's just a really, really good sort of page turner. It's actually a really poor tactical decision, though, to take to a desert island because mm. um, you can only read it once. So um, I do, I do like, uh, uh, I, I do like the sort of the fact books as well. Um, and uh, um, I think, um, okay, so I, I, uh, what would be my best sort of non-fiction book that I would take? Um, do you know there was a book that I read years ago? that um, was about data, it was called Big Data, and it was about, no, sorry, I'm going to change my mind, the Caroline Criado Perez book, Invisible Women. Oh, yes, that's yes. the, because that's, and in a way, yeah. that's the feminist interpretation of the Big Data book from earlier. So mm. there was a Big Data book, I'm taking three, I've, I've broken the <laughs> yeah, so, no, so the Big Data allowed. book is, is really interesting, in, in, it, it was the first book that I read that really helped me understand um, the completely different way we need to think about data and inferring from large data sets rather than mm. the sort of discipline I've been trained in, that sort of experimental design, almost randomised control trial type mm. methods. So what we can do with all the found data that's out there, I think that really opened my mind. But then another book I would recommend everyone reads is the Caroline Criado Perez book, Invisible Women, mm. because what that does is shines, it's an extremely well-researched book, and it shines a light on how important it is for us to understand the provenance of data when we are making a decision. Okay. Because we can very often think we're making a really objective decision because we've based it on mm -hmm. data. But if that data is not drawn from a broad yeah. source or a, uh, an appropriate representative source, then it leads to inappropriate decisions. Mm. Yeah, you carry carry the bias on the input there yeah. into, the, yeah. into the output there. Okay, well, thanks, Sarah, that was, that was fantastic. Um, and we've also got one final bit of advice from Sarah's grandmother. With, if it's not too late, then marry a librarian. There's a, <laughs> there's a lesson for us all, I think. Okay, thanks, Sarah. <laughs>